1924, Eamon de Valera was released. The last commandant of 1916 was released out of Kilmainham Jail. That was 1924, I should say. In 1926, the commandant general of the IRA, Frank Egan, de Valera, Sean Lamas, Sean Till Kelly, others came together to form a new party called Fianna Fáil. There was great liking for Fianna Fáil amongst Republican people, and they subscribed to it, gave their best to it. But in 1926 they registered in Lancaster House. In 1932 they stood for the elections, and they won by one seat. Now all the jails at that time were full of Republican prisoners. So Fianna Fáil decided that he would release all the prisoners out of the jail. On releasing the prisoners out of the jail, they called the snap elections the following year, 1933. They won by 77 seats to coincide with the 77 of the executions of the Civil War. Um, they got all the finance and help that they wanted off Republican people. Even George Plant was brought back from America in the 20s and he was a great man who helped the Fianna Fáil organization. There was two banks robbed in Tipperary and the proceeds of that banks went to Fianna Fáil. And and along the line it came to 1935 when the IRA went to see the heads of Fianna Fáil. The heads of the IRA at that time was Sean McBride, who was Chief of Staff, John Russell, who was Adjutant General, Paddy McGrath, Mrs. Forlong, who was an aunt of Brenda Beale. There's another person kind of in the name for the moment, old Joe Clark of the Battle of Mount Street Bridge. Went to see them in 1935. They were told by Aiken to put out their arms for a few years and strike for the freedom of the north of Ireland and to get all the aid and help that they wanted of Fianna Fáil. For a much they were tricked by that, the IRA. Because in 1936, Sean McGlynn was a prisoner of war in Harbour Hill prison up here. He was one of them that was released in 1932, rearrested because he had arms and with other men, and he found themselves back in Harbour Hill. Now, he got an awful severe beating and was kicked to death by Free State Army Red Cops. They turned around and said that he hung himself. They cut sheets down like bits of rope, put around his neck to say that he hung himself. But the autopsy proved that he had been brutally ill-treated at that time. Now, there was no prosecutions allowed into the beating that he got and the murder of him. Other prisoners that was in Harbour Hill at the time, elderly men, told me that when they, they were young at the time, but they were elderly when I met with them, and they told me of the cruelty that there was in Harbour Hill against Republican prisoners by Free State Army Red Caps. They should not have been allowed as warders in that place because they were men perhaps of the Civil War period who had carried out desperate atrocities against Republicanism below and across Ballyseedy and in other places. 
perhaps some of them was on the executions of the 77 and murders of others. There should have been, there should have been civilian wars in it. But no inquest, no nothing into Sean McGlynn. That had passed. 1937, Peter McCarthy from Dublin here, he fought the Black and Tans. He fought in the Civil War on the Republican side. He got a very nervous breakdown in prison. He was released from prison and under the amnesty of 1932, but had a, an awful way of, I don't know, good, 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 good. Um, he was coming along Comprasen Street here in Dublin when a squad car pulled up on a very high arc called Brockenbank. They had a chemist there in Thomas Street. Brockenbank. He tied him called Brockenbank. Shot him dead. Shot McCarthy dead. It was put down that through him putting his hands through his pocket that he was going for a revolver. The man was unarmed. It was just a kind of a sympathy from the Civil War period. Um, no charge against Brother Mike. No charge at all whatsoever. Chris was born in 1939, an IRA man. The IRA was out training. He stayed behind to pick up cartridges and shells. His body was found in Kilbride and it was they don't know he didn't shoot himself but he was found shot dead they put down that it was the bright hires who had shot him who had shot him 1940 brings me from 1930 into 1940 Barons McCormack, two soldiers of the Irish Republican Army, were over in England, in Birmingham. There was explosives left all at the time. Barons and McCormack was arrested. Now, any dossiers of republicanism at that time were printed by the Ebola printing works. It was owned by Oscar Trainer, partly owned by Oscar Trainer of Fina Foyle, a deserter from Republicanism. And the dossiers were sent over of those men and of others. The two men were arrested, sentenced to death, and they were hanged in Winston Green Prison in Birmingham in 1940. The Irish government was asked to intervene. They didn't intervene. And I was on bringing back the bodies in 1966 or in around that period when the bodies were brought back and we brought them down to, to, uh, to Mullingar, Kingstown or whatever they call it, and there is where the two of them were buried. It's in there. Tony Darcy, Sean McNeela, Tony Darcy from Hedford in Galway, Sean McNeela from Mayo, two prisoners of war in Mountjoy Jail, and they would not accept the conditions that was laid down to them. And they went on hunger strike. And after a period of time on hunger strike, they were moved to Pickens Military Hospital just up the street here, to where the two of them died on hunger. It was said that as they were dying, Makila shouted, Tony, why are you Tony? I'm dying, Tony. Tony Darcy got out of the bed to assist his dying comrade. He got a fall, which a short period after ended his life. The two men from one in Galway, the other from this. And their bodies was interned for a short period of time. 
Now, we come along to John Joe Cavanagh, 1940, blown cork. He came through a hole in the wall, he was put down, there was a tunnel, and he was shot dead. Instead of arresting him, he was shot dead. He was shot dead. No prosecutions was allowed into that and whatsoever. None and whatsoever. Leave me still in 1940. But Paddy McGrath and Thomas Hart were at a meeting in Relna here in Dublin, in H. E. McCown's house, when they were attacked and shots were fired at them. Thomas Hart was wounded. Thomas Hart was wounded. And I think that that's two men, one's a bit elderly looking, if somebody would go out there to advise them. I think they went to the fire door. Maybe I am rather mistaken, but I hope you hear my voice clearly. All right. I'm the late back. Paddy McGrath and Thomas Hart. Thomas Hart from Lorgan. Paddy McGrath from Candom Street in Dublin. The two men, which I said, was at a meeting above in in Jimmy Count's house where they were attacked. Shots was fired first by the branch. Thomas Hart was wounded. Peter Sullivan was wounded. Paddy McGrath, the veteran of 1916, went back to assist to assist Tom um, Hart, Thomas Hart, and the two of them were arrested. Paddy McGrath, the veteran of 1916, and being arrested, they were brought in front of a military court here in Harbour Hill. They were sentenced to be executed by pardon squad. There was a heavy appeal made for the save the lives of the two men, Joe Clark, Julia Grenons, and others went out to Black Rock, the devil near his house, and spoke to Jenny about McGrath. Jenny did speak to Dad, but the two executions were carried out in Mount Joy Jail, the two of them in Mount Joy Jail, in 1940. While Tony Darcy and Sean McNeil were on hunger strike to relate back to their name. Well, they were on hunger strike. Just a little bit down, I was a prisoner myself in Mount Jail. Just a little bit down from the sick wing, there was a wall there where Rory O'Connor, Lee Mellows, Dick Barron, John McKelvey, and others were put against that wall and shot. The execution of McGarden Hart. The blanket was put down on the ground. The sleepers were standing up. They were put in front of us, the two men, and shot. During the hunger strike that was in the prison at the time, the sound of the Lee Enfields going off, the smoke going up into the sick wing, and the smell of the sulfur going up into the sick wing, where men were dying on hunger strike. Where men were dying on hunger strike. Harry McGrath and Thomas Hart whose bodies were buried in Mount Joy Jail. I'll come later to speak about that. That. We still, in 1940, when Barney Casey was interned in the Curragh concentration camp 
along with hundreds of others, ill-treated below it. When the military red caps came into the concentration camp and coming into the military concentration camp, they opened fire, shooting Barney Casey dead. Shooting him dead. Um, no prosecution was allowed into the Feast Army murderers who carried out that brutal murder. And it was murder because those men were unarmed. Casey was shot dead. Two others were slightly wounded in it. I know and quarry allowed it was. It was just that it was a time of war and all to this effect. And that was put down us. But now with the death book. 1941, being reached to 1941, when crossing Richard Crossing, or Richard Goss from Dundalk, yes, he fired. He fired Holland, but he hit nobody. He was arrested, brought in front of the military court here in Harbour Hill, the state military court in Harbour Hill. Sentence to be dead because he fired an anyone carrying a revolver or anything that effect at the time when only the sentence of death. And he was executed below in Port Lee's prison. Buried in prison soil. Come back to that later. Then Brings me to 1942, <coughs> when George Plant of Tipperary, the one who robbed the banks for Fina Foyle, and the proceeds of that robberies, was there to help Fina Foyle, which he was very associated at the time with a liking for Fina Foyle. Now, he, he, was accused of shooting Derricks. There was five arrested. Three didn't stand trial, but they were interned. And the other two, George Plant and Joe O'Connor, were tried for it. Joe O'Connor was acquitted. Was acquitted. George Plant was found guilty by a kangaroo court, Feast of Army Military Kangaroo Court, and sentenced to death. And was brought to Portlease Prison, where he was to be executed in Harbour Hill, and there was a coffin in that lorry. Because a Feast of Army soldier spoke about that, that there was a coffin in there covered over. Plant was put up into the back of the lorry, brought down the port leash. Where there, a party squad awaited him. There was no period of time that he'd have a few hours to, that had been appealed and all that effect. And none of that was allowed into it. None of that was allowed into it. He was just taken down off the lorry. The blanket on the ground to soak his blood. The sleepers put up, and when the sleepers were put up, he um, he was put facing the it and shot dead, buried in prison soil, buried in prison soil. Morris, Neil, from Kerry was also faced that same police and army court above here in Harbour Hill and he was found guilty. No witness was allowed into those courts. No witnesses or anything was allowed into those courts. Um, he was found guilty of something that others was involved in. He was there. What did he do to shooting? 
was proven after that he didn't do the shooting. Still he was sentenced to death in that prison above here, brought down to Mountjoy Jail, where McGrann Hart in the men of the Civil War, at that same spot that the sleeper stood up and put in front of the sleeper, put in front of the sleeper and shot dead. Buried in prison soil. Buried in prison soil. Now, Tommy Williams above in Belfast, there's no harm to say it now because the man who done the shooting was a great friend of mine. And he done the shooting. Tommy Williams didn't do the shooting. And that was Joe Cahill done the shooting. And chopped it nearly to death. And won the RUC, won the B specials. Um, they were arrested. And Thomas Hart, who was the leader at the time, 18 years of age, of that section, was condemned to death and was brought over. An English man was brought over to hang him, to hang him in 1942, buried in prison soil. A short few years ago, we got his remains back out of it and buried him in the town cemetery. I was there. I was there. At all those funerals of the men who was executed in the parties. I was only a youngster when all their bodies were released. When all their bodies were released. And I was there at them. And Tommy Williams. Had he there with 1942 was at a wedding in Cavan at his sister's funeral. Had he, um, had he there with him? They were attacked, attacked by the branch which the name had changed to the special branch. They did open fire. Killing Paddy Dermody, Walsh, who was the superintendent in charge of that raid. Killing Paddy Dermody, wounding little Harry O'Neill and uh, Harry White. I don't know, in the White. Harry White in the back. Harry escaped. Later, Harry was in Belfast when he was arrested. I'm brought down to Dublin. I'm at Bryant, severely stood against the court. Severely stood against the court, insulting the judges in a way. And little Harry White was charged with the murder, with murder, but that was acquitted. But he was sentenced to 14 years of imprisonment. Little Harry White. Um, he was in Port Leash, along with Jack McCorton, that's Samos McCorton, the son of the great man of Cork, with Jack McCorton, former chief of staff of the IRA, Paddy McLogan, and all those who were in Port Leash prison at that period of time. Come back to speak. Jackie Griffith from Rings End in Dublin was coming up from Rings End when he got into Hollett Street where there a branch with a Thompson machine gun opened fire on an unarmed man 20 years of age an unarmed man 20 years of age and shot him brutally dead those that was looking out of Hollis Street Hospital at the time, at the time, one of the ghost witnesses <coughs> and other people that seen what there was, was put down that it was an emergency act at the time in the 40s. No prosecutions was allowed into it. Gantley was the one 
who done the shooting. There are some gangsters here in Dublin, Labadee and Nolan and others, at the Hamelin factory below there, and they were attacked. They were what an IRA and there was nothing to do with the IRA at home as well. They had rod banks and stuff like that. Lovely and old. Um, Gantley, the superintendent who led a raid who had shot Griffith dead. He led a raid at the Hamelain factory and one of his own shot him dead. One of his own policemen shot him dead. Um, it was a good jail, but that was justice, or whatever else like that is. But uh, Lavity and Owen was later arrested and got imprisonment. I knew both of those later years. I knew both of them. It was in, in around 1948 or something like that, is when that raid took one day for Robin Stock here in Dublin. Um, he was shot dead in any way. I was shot dead. Shot dead. No, where am I now? I was Jackie Griffith. Charlie Curtin's OC of the Kelly Brigade, Adjutant General of the IRA also. There was a, a sergeant of the police who was shot. Cairns was arrested afterwards. The flinchy evidence that there was that his fingerprints were found on the cross part of a bike, which no civilian court would have accepted that in whatsoever. No civilian court would have accepted that in whatsoever. And he was condemned to death by hanging. He was hanged in 1940, 1944 in Mountjoy Jail. The same English hangman that hanged Barons of McCormack in 1942, Pierpoint, that same hangman's family was on the executions at Kevin Barry and the others. Going back to the 20. Pierpoint was brought over in 1944 to hang the Commandant General of the IRA, Charlie Curtis. That same hangman that hanged Barnes McCormack, Tommy Williams, and then to put the rope around that man's neck and hang him. He's buried in prison soil in Mount Joy Jail, where he was hanged. Leads me to 1946 to Sean McCaughey from Tyrone. Sean McCaughey, along with Charlie McLeod, Liam Rice, Peter Flynn, who did the car, arrested Stephen Hayes above in Belfast and brought him to Dublin to be Count's house, where there he was court martialed for the Irish Republican Army, known as the IRA. He was court-martialed and they got a statement out. A part of that statement says that when Stephen Hayes met with Dr. Ryan at Fianna Fáil at the Gresham Hotel, he told him that Sean Russell was dead in the port of Gibraltar. And that is part of the confession. Now, other stories related to the death of Sean Russell, that Sean Russell's body was washed up in a port, some port or another, and that he was seen here in Dublin, disappeared and never got. Then the other story, whether it's true or not, I don't know, that he died on a German U-boat. I don't know how true that story is, I don't know, because I don't know. But, relating back to 
George Plant, led him back to George Plant. George Plant had been tried twice in civilian court and was acquitted twice in that civilian court. And being acquitted in that civilian court, he was rearrested and under the orders. And I found this out that De Valera willfully wanted George Plant out of the way because he had so much on Fina Fire. And De Valera's own want that George Plant would be executed. And George Plant was executed. Now, it wasn't till 1948 that the remains of those men were released out of it. I was in the Fina Aaron at that time. And the bodies getting brought from Port Leash, from Mount Yai, and other places to the various counties to be buried. Now, the bodies would have been still there if Fina Foyle had remained as the government. But they were lost the elections was to, uh, to Fine Gael, Plan of Public and others who formed the government, who did form a government, and in forming that government, their bodies was released. Dick Spring, or um, Dan Spring of Kerry, the part of that disease, I call him a disease, Dick Spring. Um, his father was the one who demanded that the bodies would be released, but well, the bodies was going to be released in any way. And I am very proud to say, as a youngster, that I was on the funerals of those men in my Fina Erin uniform. And the harassment that I was standing on pots and stuff to that, a vermit scum, known as a special lunch. There's always one amongst an audience, and I always dress them, which I address them on platforms and to their faces as vermit scum, British agents. And that's where he addressed them as. And I remember going along with the lay, Eamon Mockamash, Eamon Thomas, as I always known as Eamon Thomas. The John Jimmy Carroll of Leitrim, years after, when I became a member of the Irish Republican Army in 1952. And we went to visit the graves of those men that had been murdered in the 40s. Down to Tony Darcy, to the edge of the Atlantic, down to Hefford and Galway, across the McNeil and Ballina, or beside Ballina, down outside of Ballina. And there were other places to where, down to Feathered and Tipperary, to George Plant, Paddy McGrath here in Dublin, Thomas Hart here in Dublin, and Thomas Hart, they buried him in Milltown Cemetery. And I remember distinctly when Sean McCaughey's remains came from Portley's prison in 1946. When his remains came up and a multitude of people who marched, who marched up all the way. And when we got up to the bridge, old Pat Shannon, great old kite old Pat Shannon, he drew an old 45 revolver and stood on the pot and four three shots. But it was only a bow and arrow. It was respects to Sean McCaughey's remains. And Sean McCaughey was sent up to Belfast to be buried in Belfast after dying in Portley's prison. Thomas Hart was sent up to where he came from in the north with freestyle army bullets in him. 
Well, it was accepted. I bought off the British and to send them up to it. To it. To it. I notice on this little thing that there are 22 names. That word 22 is an awful burden to Republicans because in 22 that the compromise was set up and accepted. Is in 22 that the Free Staters murdered Republicans at will to maintain a British presence here in Ireland and they done that with a very cruel, rotten manner. And I notice on the headstone in Glass Neville Cemetery when I was one of them in 1984 to put that stone up to our beloved hunger strikers. To our beloved hunger strikers. And the first of that was of Thomas Hirsch from Kerry. The man who left us with that. Lord, let me carry your cross for Ireland. Thomas Hirsch died in the Manor Hospital at being on hunger strike in Mount Joy when he burst his gullet, burst into the Manor Hospital, <coughs> where he died after five days in the Manor Hospital. A massage. Parents Mike Sweeney, the mayor of Cork, who died in Brixton Prison, who died in Brixton Prison, and he sent for his sister Mary, and he told her, that he would die for the Republic. That he would die for the Republic. Fitzgerald and Murphy, at that same period, 1920, died on that hunger strike. And Fitzgerald went a day longer than Max Sweeney on hunger strike. And then we come to the Civil War period, when Joseph Whitty of Wexford, young lad from Wexford, Andy Sullivan, Andy Sullivan, and Dennis Barney, them two from Cork, will let die an under free state government, an under an Irish free state government, will let die an hunger strike. And that had gone, and we came to 1940, and Tony Darcy and Sean McNeela, two prisoners of war, will let die. Brickings Blicken, up here and under the hands of Fianna Fáil. Sean McCarthy in 1946 was let die and under the Diamond de Valera government. Pardon me for a moment, please. Because he kept telling them, oh yes, we're giving you your rights. And he moved them prison to prison. And each prison he went to, you got no rights. And McGoughan died in the English prison in 1984. Yeah. In 1970, 1974. And I remember negotiating here with others negotiated in London get his remains back. But we got his remains back. I brought him to Adam and Eve's church below down there where we waked him overnight. The following day we brought him down to Badana to bury him. 1975 the last murder committed by the priest of the army was young Tommy Smith on Patrick's Day 1985 I should say. 1985. 1986, that beautiful friend, Frank Stike, that lovely round face of Frank Stike. I knew Frank Stike. And Frank Stike 
in an English prison decided that he would die rather than accept the conditions. And he died on the Holy Spirit. Arrangements were made to bring back his remains back here and we got him back. I went with the Stag family to the Dublin airport where there we were told that the plane had gone to the Shannon. The plane had gone to the Shannon. The plane came down on the Shannon. The special branch handled the funeral, handled his coffin, brought him into a little mortuary. Whatever happened in that out, we don't know. He was brought to Leek Cemetery and buried on a hill in Leek Cemetery. That was on the Saturday. A multitude of Republicans gathered on that Sunday, the following day. And I seen, I seen police shivering with fright of so many people there. And there was a few revolvers pointing, not at them, but at them. And his body was buried up above that hill. And for two solid years, the special branch stood in under the orders of Cockroach Cooney, Paddy Cooney of Fine Gael, with the help of the Labour Party of Cruz O'Brien and of others. And two years after, the Irish Republican Army dug down when the special branch was withdrawn off it, when Peter Foy got back in, they withdrew that. Special Branch Office, and they drawn the Special Branch Office. The Irish Republican Army dug down, two soldiers of the Irish Republican Army dug down, took his remains out of it, and buried them along with McGoughan and the Tobins and others in the Republican plot in the East Cemetery in Belfast. 1981 was an awful time the Republican people of that hunger strike that I wish had never happened. That I wish would never happen. And we Bobby Sands and Francis Hughes and Ray McCreesh and Patty O'Hara and John McDonald and Martin Fossil. Kevin Lynch, Karen Doherty, Thomas McElroy and Nicky Devine. And above all the hunger strikers that ever there was, a great respects for Mickey Devine. As Mickey de Boyne was born in the most published part of Europe. He was born in the Springtown camp in Derry. There were huts that was left behind by the Americans. And that's where they put the Catholics to live in those huts. And that's where he was born in the Springtown camp in Derry. The persecution of the people. He joined an organization. He was arrested wrongfully twice. And then he was sent off to the H-blocks where there were Bobby and Francis and others with young McLevy and others he decided that he would go and he died on hunger strike Mickey Devine and I hope and pray to God that I never hear of another hunger striker or there'll never be another hunger striker who will give his life for Ireland because no government because I wouldn't have loved to go to Belfast up to the maze with a sledgehammer and bash that door in I got my bended knees to Bobby Sands and the others and say don't do it Bobby the British wouldn't give in to Thomas Ash in 1917 and they're not going to give in to you now in 1981 and they're not going to give in to you now in 1981. But unfortunately, the ten supreme young men died. And they died for Ireland, for an Irish cause. Could I meet them all, but that's all I have to say.